headlight glare. We've been complaining about it literally for decades. But recently, it seems like those complaints have reached kind of a fever pitch. It does beg the question, is headlight glare really and objectively worse? If so, why? Or is this all just a disaffected few venting on social media? Well, today, we're going to dig into it. So, welcome back to All Cars, y'all. If you're new here, my name is John, and come with me on a trip into the fascinating world of headlight glare. Automakers and regulators have had to walk a fine line between headlights being bright enough to illuminate for the driver, but not a nuisance or a danger to other drivers. And it's not just an academic exercise. Statistics show that while we do only about 25% of our driving at night, 50% of traffic deaths happen in the dark. I've done a whole video on the history of headlights, and that's worth a watch, but we need to do a quick refresher here to kind of set the stage for this discussion. Once cars started moving from acetylene to electric, and by the 1920s, the Bilux bulb combining both high and low beams was introduced, and in 1940, the seven inch round sealed beam headlight was made mandatory in the US, essentially freezing our lighting technology. Every car was required to have just two of these, no more and no less. But in 1957, the law changed, allowing for four smaller five and three quarter inch round sealed beams. And by then, people were already complaining about glare. The August 1956 edition of Popular Science had an article about the change to four headlights, explaining the pros and the cons, and specifically mentioning multiple times glare from headlights. I feel confident knowing humankind didn't take until 1956 to begin complaining about other drivers. Today, with the help of social media, the complaints about glare continue to grow. With groups like Reddit's F Your Headlights with over 44,000 members, petitions to the NHTSA to limit intensity by organizations such as the Soft Lights Foundation, and members of Congress agreeing to take action on the issue. But there's three general reasons I've identified that glare both appears to be a bigger issue today, but they're actually probably not what you're thinking. First, it's not simply the brightness or the intensity of the lights. While this is certainly part of it, it does not tell a complete story. In 1962, the first halogen lights for cars, the H1, was introduced. And, of course, it was illegal in the U.S. At the time, European regulations allowed 140,000 candela per side, but in the U.S. it was limited to just 37,500, or less than one-third of what Europe allowed. Which brings up the question, what is a candela? Well, because this is not a scientific channel, and we're not going to do a scientific breakdown of it, the best thing to say is, let's just assume it's the intensity of the light. These limits were changed in 1978 when the U.S. finally raised its intensity levels all the way up to 75,000 candela per side for the high beams, a standard that we still have in the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards Part 108, but in the EU, those regulations have now been raised all the way up to 430,000 candela per car. The bi-xenon headlights and the high-intensity discharge lamps were introduced in the early 1990s, giving some cars like BMWs a distinctive bluish tint, and in the early 2000s, LEDs were introduced. But the complaints about glare have been growing around low beams, not just high beams. A look at table XIX-A from that part 108 standards shows various test points for light intensity allowed for low beams. And looking in the far right column at maximum intensity, there are only six spots where it's necessary to test with all others essentially being infinite light allowed. Journalist Jason Kamasa with Haggerty got on the Carmudgeon Show and discussed that automakers will design the lights to hit the standards only in those exact points that are being measured with massive overlighting everywhere else. And he's calling it Lighting Gate. So with little regulatory input from the NHTSA, the 
Insurance Institute for Highway Safety began testing headlights, rating them as poor, marginal, acceptable, and good, where essentially good is just brighter. By their own data, good rated headlights were associated with a 19% reduction in nighttime single vehicle crashes when compared to poor ones. Shockingly, for those who believe glare is only getting worse, the IIHS points out that they do evaluate for glare and that the amount of glare has been decreasing since 2016. The biggest factor they found in causing glare? Misaimed headlights, not the brightness. So automakers striving to get the absolute best rating possible for their vehicles in these IIHS tests have entered a sort of lighting arms race, including bragging about it in ads like this one from Mercedes showing the lights being so bright it can almost show an x-ray through a cow. And it should be noted that this is not just a U.S. problem. While the EU is up to about three generations ahead of us in automobile lighting, a consumer study from 2024 showed that 80% of drivers there experience glare on a regular basis and classify it as annoying or unbearable. But the second big issue is the quality of the light itself. Those sealed beam headlights that we used for decades and the halogen lights that followed gave off more of a yellowish hue and that is softer and much more comfortable for humans. The HID lights and the LED lights that followed gave off more of a, a blue or a white tint and while that light is much more crisp when being thrown down the road, many people find it uncomfortable. The bluish light has more energy behind it, and with more energy hitting your retina, you can literally feel fatigue or find yourself squinting against it, even if it's not objectively that bright. Perhaps even more important is flicker. LEDs are incredibly energy efficient, and they use what's called pulse width modulation to dim the lights, essentially turning individual LEDs off very quickly. A poor comparison would be to think about those old fluorescent bulbs you'd have up in the ceiling where they just flickered a little bit. While for high quality LEDs you may not be able to detect it, and at some lower frequencies you may be able to catch it out of the corner of your eye or when the car is moving, as cars tend to do. And some people are very susceptible to this flicker, but even if you're not noticing it consciously, it's still wearing you down. It's especially noticeable when the car is running with its daytime running lights because by their definition, they're running at a lower power. But perhaps the most insidious problem is the height of the lights. With the U.S. and sometimes Europe having ever higher SUVs and sport utility vehicles, they have to set standards on how high those lights can be mounted. In the U.S., both the upper and lower beam headlights have to be a minimum of 22 inches, but no more than 54 inches. But the trick comes in how they're aligned. To set the alignment, the vehicle is pulled about 25 feet from the wall. You find the center point height, which is a little circular mark on the lens of your light, and you measure it. If you are 36 inches or less, you use that measurement and mark it on a wall. But if it's over 36 inches, you set that point on the wall two inches lower than your optical center on the lens. Now, the lights are adjusted so that your cutoff level is at that height. But stop and think about that for a minute. If you have a truck that has the maximum height of 54 inches, they're going to set that cutoff line at 52 inches per the SAE regulations around aiming headlights. Well, in my car, the headrest, the top of the headrest, is about 52 to 54 inches tall, which means that any truck is going to be shining directly into my eyes, even if the headlights are adjusted absolutely correctly. <laughs> 
LEDs allow for precise aiming of each individual light and adaptive beams can actually turn off or aim the LEDs to avoid oncoming drivers to put them in shadow or highlight the edges of the road. And that spares other drivers from dazzling glare. And while the EU has had adaptive systems since 2009, the U.S. just changed their regulations in 2022, but they're poorly written and they're somewhat contradictory with each other. And the automakers have basically been avoiding the systems because they can't meet these contradictory standards. The science is clear that more light leads to less accidents, at least for single drivers, but the data doesn't exist for accidents where the driver was blinded by an oncoming vehicle. I can't find anything because I believe that there's many cases where a driver has an accident because they were blinded. The other driver that blinded them is just totally oblivious and continued on down the road. So the only data that could be dug up is largely subjective after the fact in a police report. And nobody's compiled that and tried to do an actual study to show when an accident occurred because the other person was blinded, not whether you could see down the road better because you had more powerful headlights. And it's telling that while the EU drivers complain, their standards are nearly two times the U.S.'s, but we're the ones making the most noise about it. And the solution? Well, it's multiple things. Standards around the aiming of the light, especially for trucks and SUVs, more down and less into the eyes of drivers. Standards around the color or the coolness of the light, moving away from bluish or white tints. Heck, even the French use yellow lights for decades. And studies showed always a small decrease in glare and eye tiredness when using them. Also, the U.S. could go ahead and jump into the late 20th century with some adaptive beam technology and writing codes that actually matter. And states stepping up and actually requiring headlight aim during safety inspections. Not everyone does an inspection and not everyone checks the aim on the headlights. This is a simple thing that typically requires an adjustment and no real cost and improves the safety of everyone else around them. But opponents of glare and harsh lighting feel that adaptive driving beams are only a band-aid for the problem, that the actual problem is the color of the light, the intensity of the light, the aiming of the light. The adaptive beams are just kind of a panacea for a bigger issue, but I do believe they are the future. So in conclusion, is glare a problem? Well, it kind of depends on who you ask. Many drivers, myself included, have been blinded while driving by lights that were overbright or misaimed or far too high. And it seems to be multiple things that are going to have to be done to try to fix it. And sadly, although people are making noise and congressmen have said, well, we need to do something about this and encouraging the NHTSA to revise and modernize their regulations, the fact is the data doesn't show glare being a problem. And it's hard to get regulations changed when you can't actually prove it objectively. Thanks so much for being here, y'all. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this, please consider giving it a like. If you really loved it and you think I earned it, please consider subscribing to the channel and see more videos just like this. And of course, once again, many thanks to my patrons who support help make these silly videos totally possible. Thanks for being here, y'all.